A people have passed this way, a whole people. And they've left the poles of their burial scaffolds to mark the trail where they've passed. Their story in the trail itself goes back 20,000 years. The people live on after a fashion, but the trail ended less than 100 years ago. Here, on the great American plains, in the country of the Absaraka, near the river called the Greasy Grass. By the 1870s, the telephone, the mimeograph, the steam turbine had all been invented. We Americans were smack in the middle of the machine age, worshiping the wheel, we said. But at the same moment, they're dead in the sky. Not out of ignorance, but by deliberate choice, some of us were still living literally in the Stone Age. Which Stone Age American, wrapped in his sleeping robe, journeyed from here to the beyond country, to the camp of many lodges? No one knows. No one knows his name, nor how, nor when he died. All that is known is that he lived on horseback. And his home was all around him, here on the Great Plains. He had never mapped the land, nor knew that the geographers who had scornfully labeled it the Great American Desert, called it a permanent barrier to civilization. So sterile the devil couldn't raise hell on it, save in very small clinkers. Hospitable only to serpent savages. But to the savage, his title was clear and indisputable. Whatever is cut by the feet of our pony, that is our land. Whatever is slashed by our lodge poles, that is our sky. And that was all the land that lay between the Mississippi and the Rockies, between the big river and the backbone of the world, and north from the salt fork of the Red River, across the medicine line into Canada, the grandmother's land. What the map called a desert was actually one enormous rippling blanket of grass. This was the Great Plains. Here on land, every square inch of which promised to be theirs forever, lived more than half of the Indians in North America. Here lived the Absaroki, the people of the Raven, called the Crow, the Blackfeet and the Assiniboine, the Stone Boilers, the Cree of the Blackened Faces, and the Arikaras. Here lived the Crazy Knife people, the Kiowa, and the Osage of the Shaved Heads, and the Missouri of the Dugout Canoe. Here too were the people of the Puckett Moccasin, the Chippewa of the Plains, and the Wind River Shoshone, and the Comanche, called the Snake People, and the Pawnee, called the Wolf People. Here were the Sissitas, the Cut-Arm Cheyenne, and the Strong Heart Arapaho, the people of the Blue Cloud. And around them all like a hoop, and darting through them all like an arrow, the Teton Dakota, the seven tribes of the Sioux Nation. But the land was not theirs alone. It had been given them to share with the grasshopper and the black hawk and the great bull of the prairie. The earth belonged to all the things which lived on it and the ghosts of all things which had lived on it. And there was an exaltation in them when they sang of their land. Here the two-leggeds and the four-leggeds lived together like relatives. All living things with feet and wings and roots are our children and our thoughts rise high as the eagles do. The Indian prayed to the sky and the earth and the cardinal points. These were the six grandfathers, all natural forces, everything which existed, an accidental rock on the prairie, the wind's whisper. He was related to all things and all things were related to the everywhere spirit. Above people listen, underwater people listen. Send a soft wind from the south and let it warm the earth and let it blow the coals of our cooking fires and warm our lodges and let a good thing happen to our people. But the people, divided into 60 different tribes and separated by seven different languages, had only one thing in common, a way of life. And one thing more, a pathetic belief that a break of willows would hold back a wind which would blow from four directions at once. When the Indian first saw the four-way wind, the whirlwind, 
He didn't know it because in the beginning it was just a wisp of smoke on the prairie. The red man had seen the white man before, of course, and had occasional friendly contact with traders and trappers. But he had seen so few of them, he was certain there were not very many. Now he was seeing more, and they were all in a hurry to reach the mountains. It was 1849, and each day on the prairie was one more day of poverty to California-bound gold seekers. The Dakota first called them Wasichu, which meant godlike. Other tribes had other names, more descriptive. Hat-wearing people, men whose leggings meet in the middle, and hairy mouths. They told the Indian, we want no more of your land than the width of our axles, and that for no longer than it takes to leave it behind. These would-be millionaires were an amusing curiosity to the Indian. The wagon people tell us about the yellow metal in the shining mountains and how it'll make them rich and big among their people. And then they begged the Indian for food. And another one said, when the sun is not in the sky, they cannot find the trail and they get lost. Then they become angry at their horses, but their horses are lost too. They make me laugh. And one said, the wagon people are very rude. Some of them smell bad. It annoyed the gold rushes that the Indian considered himself lord of his own domain. They are as arrogant as all of them. It is grinding to be patronized in such lofty manner by these prairie aristos who dress their hair in dog fat and paint their pantaloons on in the morning. As the shining metal seemed to magnetize more and more wagons west, the Indians' curiosity and accommodation gave way to uneasiness. More and more they stopped the wagon trains to parley and asked the same questions they had asked the train preceding it. Why do you keep coming into our country, frightening away our game, and setting fire to our grass? Each time you say that your wagon will be the last, and each time a wagon follows you, and each time they would be soothingly assured there's no cause for alarm. We only want passage across your land, not the land itself. It was a promise the Indian was to hear many times from people who were just passing through. The Plains Indian had once just been passing through himself. Originally a forest dweller and farmer, he had straggled onto the prairie, pushed there from the east by other tribes and European colonizers. Here, he had discovered a strange and awesome beast, brought to the New World by Spanish conquistadores, the medicine dog, the horse, and he built a whole new culture around it. Wrote one observer, every savage is born with six legs, two of his own and four of his ponies. He all mounts to dance with it, but he'd sooner do both on horseback. And like most nomads, they bred almost none of their stock themselves, replenishing it by trading and by raiding. Nor did they keep horses for meat and milk. Pony eating time was their name for famine. Their staple diet was buffalo meat, and an estimated 60 million bison making up the continental herd was an inexhaustible commissary on the hoof. It also provided the raw material for clothing and shelter and weapons. In fact, most everything the Indian needed had to be mined from the shaggy carcass of the buffalo. Like the Indians, they were immigrants of the Great Plains. They went where the grass was and followed the seasons around the zodiac. Said a crow chief, this is how we live. When the summer heat scorches the prairie and the moon of cherry ripening, we can draw up onto the mountains where the air is sweet and cool, the grass fresh, and the bright streams come tumbling out of the snowbanks. There we can hunt the antelope and the deer when their skins are fit for dressing. There we will find plenty of white bears and mountain sheep. 
the autumn, when the yellow leaves come, when our horses are fit and strong from the mountain pastures, we can go down to the plains and hunt the buffalo and the elk, or trap beaver on the streams. And when the cold moon comes, the moon of the frost in the teepee, and the tree popping moon, we can take shelter in the woody bottoms along the rivers. And there we will find salt weed and cottonwood bark for our ponies and buffalo meat for ourselves. The Indian then was a nomad. A more advanced civilization called him by another name, vagrant. It was the moon of the birth of the calves and the spring thaws that melted the snow. But the people still saw something white on the prairie. More wagons, more pudding-footed oxen, more white-faced people. A Sioux prophet had said, the Wasatchu are like bees, first one, then the swarm. Pressured out of the east by overpopulation, political unrest, bad debts, bad crops, these were family men now, bringing their families with them. The Indian called their women squaw white men. And generally, he was not impressed. One of them said, her face like toothache. Maybe so she bite on green quince. Nor were the emigrants impressed. Expecting Longfellow's here water, the noble savage, we met instead with starveling beggars. They exact generous gifts in return for our passage and are indifferent that we carry little that can be spared in our getting there. The Indian had none of the European devotion to the concept of property, but he put an almost holy value on the virtue of generosity. Convinced that the white man's stinginess was based on ignorance, he sought to educate him by stealing what he felt should have been gracefully given noted one pioneer, what he wouldn't steal, a hound pup wouldn't pull out of a tan yard. White hot stoves are generally accounted to be safe in their presence. Red hot stoves, however, are not. Resentful of paying tribute and wary of revenge if they didn't, emigrant trains took to corralling in defensive circles. They bolted nervous meals and quieted their fretful children with a new bogeyman. If you don't behave, the Indians will get you. And in the teepee, there was also a new culture frightening. If you don't behave, the Wasatchu will get you. The Indians' love for their children was extravagant. Noted one pioneer, they are hopelessly spoiled. Until the age of two, they are laced in a cradle board, never out of their mother's sight. She corrects petulance or other naughty behavior by ignoring it. No Indian cub is ever beaten, and they account us as barbaric because we occasionally strike our young. These redskins are raised by example, not precept, for they have no concept of abstract right and wrong. Their children are insatiable in their appetite for admiration and praise. And what passes for character and virtue amongst them stems entirely from this. Childhood was pleasant, but short, for they are expected to become adults as quickly as possible. Betrothals were theoretically family arranged, but like everywhere else, the young people often had their own ideas. Sky treading bird of the prairie, wonderful fawn eyed one. When you are beside me, my heart sings. A branch it is, dancing, dancing before the wind spirit in the moon of strawberries. Considering the harsh realities of nomadic life, Indian courtship was surprisingly romantic. A trip to the stream for water could provide countless accidental brief encounters. And, for the more bashful suitors, there were more discreet trysts, nighttime visits to check the pony herd, and whisperings muffled through the dewcloth of a teepee. Earth smiles, the waters smile, and even the sky of clouds smiles. But I, 
I lose the way of smiling when you are not near. Marriage was solemnized by bestowal of gifts on the bride's family. And while polygamy was allowed, the extra cost was usually prohibitive. A man rich enough to take a second wife was generally smart enough to marry his wife's sister. This minimized both the family friction and the number of in-laws. One pioneer woman could admire a Cheyenne housewife. She is vain of her domestic duties and would bitterly resent any recommendation that he who protects the home should help erect it. Hers is a life which would debilitate an Egyptian pyramid builder. What is the men do? What is merely exhausting the women? Divorce is uncommon and a runaway wife is held in disgrace by her own family. Infidelity is rare. The penalty, facial mutilation. Today we saw a cut nose squaw, a wretched creature and a warning that even here, so far from a Christian altar, there are brambles in the primrose path. The Indian wondered now what the Wohors were bringing in the wagons and why the people who were just passing through were planting seeds around his lodges. Had not a long ago grandfather Thomas Jefferson said, it may be regarded as certain that not a foot of land will ever be taken from the Indians without their consent. But now another grandfather had touched the pen to something called the Homestead Act, which gave grab deed and sit down title to 160 acres of prairie to anyone who wanted it. To cropped out eastern farmers, a land velvet with buffalo grass cried for the deep gash of the plow. They turned the prairie wrong side up, said the Indian. And he couldn't understand why his land had become something called public domain and why the white man's spotted buffalo was called private property and couldn't be hunted. He was puzzled to learn that the rights of prior possession seemed to date only from the arrival of the newcomers and that somehow his land was to pass to their sons. And there were so many of them, for they multiplied at twice the rate he did. And their cubs would grow to look on his land as real estate and his people as trespassers on it. And he tried to file his own title. The soil you see is not ordinary soil. It is the dust of the flesh and the bones of our ancestors. You will have to dig deep to find nature's earth as the upper portion is crow. And a Sioux warrior said, the earth is our mother. One does not pound stakes in his mother. The plains culture was based on warfare. An Indian's wealth was reckoned in horses and his prestige and the number he could afford to give away. Both depended on raiding the herds of his neighbors. Warfare, not on the grand scale of the white man, but raid and counter-raid was a way of life. From infancy, every boy was raised to combat as a profession, a sport and a part of his religion. And it demanded exhaustive training in physical endurance and the skills of weaponry. Enrollment in a war party was always voluntary and eagerly sought after. In some tribes, no boy was accepted as a recruit until, armed only with a bow, he had attacked a hornet's nest, could keep at least three arrows in flight at once, and could hit a grasshopper on the bound. Prayer, dreaded only old age, and if he could do it gloriously, would deliberately seek death in battle. Glory, individual glory, was the dominant motive in Indian warfare. The right to wear the eagle feather or to paint a boastful record of one's exploits on his lodge cover could only be earned by conspicuous acts of bravery. To kill an enemy was not especially praiseworthy. That could be done without honor from ambush. Many Indian battles were virtually bloodless. Each warrior would try to seek out an armed opponent for single combat. The object was to strike a blow of varying degrees of honor with a bare hand, an empty gun, a feather-tipped spear, or the flat of a bow. 
wounds and death were common enough, but always incidental to glory. Scalps were coveted, not as honors, but as trophies. The Great Plains was a perpetual arena of inter-tribal civil war. The Indians were so concerned with fighting each other that there were things they saw too late. Shoveling down the crowns between wheel ruts had turned westbound wagon trails into roads, and roads ran east and west. Lightning stages and jerk line freights were clattering on point-to-point -point schedules and bringing to the wilderness that basic credo of civilization, the timetable. Temporary passage had become right of way, and the Indian was warned to stay wide of the roads because your feathers frighten our horses. And he saw his rivers, too, being ground by wheels. Where the fireboats roiled the Missouri and the Snake and the Yellowstone, the buffalo refused to come and drink. And low water didn't stop them either. For they could navigate, it was said, tears of a weeping woman. The Wasatchew turned the streams into turnpikes and timbered out the banks for fuel, and said he had something called riverine and riparian rights. The Indian was being squeezed. And then he was run over by the black metal snake. The fireboat that walks on the mountain cut his land into strips, crisscrossed it with feeder lines, and set it afire with embers from his patented spark arresters. And they axed out what was left of his woodlands, for ties and trestles. Running alongside like a picket fence with telegraph poles. And the Indian hated the whispering wires because they marked the course of the railroad. The Indian watched the wagons that are tied together, bringing in not only more settlers, but the blue-dressed soldiers. Wrote one sympathetic dog face. I'd feel the same way John Indian does if a pack of Chippeways had scooched down on Boston Common and then told me to keep up the grass. The army was there to prevent trouble, look for it, but it was on the way. Herds of beef cattle, worth only $3 a head, were pushed north from breeding grounds of Texas, up the Chisholm Trail, and the Western, and the Goodnight and Bozeman Trails. At the end of the long drive, they fattened up and tallied out at $40 a head. But the cattle trail had cut across the game trail. The Indian, hunting the shaggy buffalo, found that the best grass and water had been staked out for the spotted buffalo. It takes 8,000 acres of prairie to support a single Indian by the chase, said the herdsman. Using the same lands, we can put meat on the table of half the world. When I was a boy, the Sioux owned the world. Where are our lands? Who owns them now? The Indian is a scavenger with no more title to the land than a jackass rabbit. Wherever I go, there is sharp wire to tear my pony's flanks. If I cannot hunt, my people will sicken. My children will starve. Hungry, why they ought to have the hot soup of justice everlasting me pumped into them. They are fat thieves. If my white brother says I am fat, it is because I have been stuffed with lies. You don't courthouse a varmint, you have to kill it. In the dialogue between the possessor and the dispossessed, there was no communication, only exchange. The original game of cowboys and Indians was going to be played for keeps, as the rancher, like other settlers, built his outbuildings an extra log thicker and pierced them with loopholes. I cannot eat the grasshoppers or the white men, so I eat what they have left. The Indian had little choice, for his own commissary had been deliberately destroyed. The Gandhi dances 
and track layers who built the railroad were fed on buffalo meat. Tens of thousands were slaughtered and butchered on the prairie. The completed railroad sent out refrigerator cars to fetch only the choice cuts for the eastern market. The rest of the meat was left to rot where it fell. But it was the curved knives of the skinners which did the most damage. Stinking, flea-bitten gold mines, they called the buffalo. A bronze medal should be presented to every hunter with a dead buffalo on one side and a discouraged Indian on the other, they said. These men had the solution to the Indian problem. Almost overnight, they would reduce a herd of 60 million buffalo to a few hundred stragglers. Then they gleaned the bones and shipped them each to be ground into fertilizer and carved into knife handles. One paper reported, bone shipments would make a string of freight cars 15,000 miles long. And when the buffalo bones played out, they exhumed dead Indians and sent their bones east to be made into button hooks. What they hoped would be a discouraged Indian became an enraged Indian. never officially declared, but at Spirit Lake, 30 settlers were killed. At the Washita, 100 Cheyenne. At Sand Creek, 300 more. At Acton, New Ulm, Birch Cooley, and Fort Ridgely, 1,500 settlers massacred. And there was Rush Creek, Springs, Dead Buffalo Lake, Kildare Mountain, Little Missouri. The names have been forgotten, most of them. Perhaps that's the greatest tragedy, that anonymous people died in unremembered places from causes they never completely understood. Misunderstanding, Indian and white. That is mostly what set the prairie on fire. White face, bad heart, said the Indian. And the crime committed by the last white man he saw would be avenged against the next white man he saw. The only good Indian is a dead Indian. And the best Indian is one who is good and dead, said the white man. And few of them bothered to distinguish between one bit of a tribe and another or for that matter, between tribes. The friendly Indian was often punished for the misdeeds of the hostels. Because, being friendly, he was easiest to find. All this time, the different tribes were still fighting each other. At first, the whites encouraged this. The one thing that worried them was anything that would unify the Indian nations, like the sun dance. The Plains Indians danced to the beat of many different drums but the sun dance was common to the entire culture as east of all Christians, and as sacred. It united all the bands of a tribe, and increasingly one tribe with another. It was dedicated to the renewal of the earth, the making over again of the whole world. Dances were fulfilling pledges made during the year, and the depth of their piety was in the degree of self-torture they endured. Fastened by thongs, skewered through their muscles. They whirled around the pole, staring at the sun for as long as their flesh could bear it, or until they tore themselves loose. The dancer's endurance brought honor to them and divine favor to their people. But the whites, horrified at this paganism, were also concerned lest the Sundance Lodge become a rallying point and they hastened to press their own religion on the Indian. Benevolent, hard-working, and well-meaning missionaries were shocked to discover that their wards wore the cross as a symbol of the four cardinal points of their own theology, and they were reluctant to abandon it for one locked in a black book they could not read. It is a good book, I am sure. Why does the white man not follow it? If there is only one true religion, why do the Methodists and the Baptists and the Black Coats all fight each other. 
I do not want your heaven when I die, and please keep your hell. There'll be no room for Indians. It'll be too full of white bad hearts. Determined to save the Indian by de-Indianizing him, the good people from the East decided to concentrate on the children. Boarding schools were established, safely removed from tribal areas and family influence. Many parents had to be bribed or intimidated to enroll their children. Sometimes the students were simply kidnapped. Complained the father of one homesick scholar. They gave him a white man's name he could not say, and hard moccasins that hurt his feet. And they cut his hair short to shame him. When he could not read the painted speech, he was beaten like a pony, as they do to white boys. My son will have to learn all over again how to be an Indian when he returns to my lodge. But where would the lodge be? Tribal hunting grounds were being platted out into municipal lots, and where there had been prairie dog towns, cities sprang up. The architecture was outhouse provincial, but each one bragged it was the Athens of the prairie. The bees had built hives and were ready to sell honey. Trading posts had whetted the Indian appetite for anything tinged with white man's medicine, and the townsmen found him a pathetically ideal customer. There's some who'd up a whole river bottom for a of beads and a bucket of axe heads. Taken as a single article, the Indian's not worth the salt to pickle his eye, though there is some profit in skinning him wholesale. Here then was another solution to the Indian problem. Teach them contempt for the things they had which were of value, and to covet the things they didn't need. thing the Wasatchew sold, which the Indian coveted most, was the fire stick. Its medicine would make any tribe the equal of any other. And while it would never make the Indian the same color as the white man, the day might come when it would make him the same size. But the white man had another weapon that would make sure this day never came. Recipe. To one barrel of Missouri River water, Add two gallons of raw alcohol, two ounces of strychnine, three plugs of tobacco and five bars of soap. Boil it in sagebrush until it's brown. This was the elixir for the Indian trade, and no one who drank it lived long enough to become addicted, wrote a newspaper. Their thirst for whiskey is matched only by an inability to accommodate it. Not a day passes, but what our better class of citizen is affronted by the sight of blanketed vagabonds who, for a bottle of the vilest liquor, will even ransom their women as brides of the multitude. Just as he had no tolerance for white men's whiskey, the Indian had no immunity to his diseases. A people to whom good health had actually been a virtue found themselves weakened and disfigured by the silent tomahawk of unfamiliar sickness. The few who succumbed to the temptations of the towns were inevitably degraded into street corner curiosities, shuffling through counterfeit war dances for whiskey money. Some went off to pose in moldy charades and dime museums, always cast as the villain. Only when advertised as a Congress of Painted Fiends with some traveling Wild West show did most city people ever see a real live Indian. They considered them, if at all, in the 1870s, with apathy, ignorance, and prejudice. If there was a place left in America for the aboriginal American, it was hardly a place of dignity. The wild tribes of the West were being inconsiderate. They refused to follow the buffalo into oblivion just to accommodate people who were only passing through. My father sent for me and said, my son, never forget my dying words. 
This country holds your father's body. Never sell the bones of your father and your mother. But somebody had sold them, along with the land. It had taken a hundred years of bribery and intimidation and dishonored treaties to legalize the trespass. No matter that the party of the first part could not read and often was not told what he had signed, or that the government sometimes decreed a man a chief so it would bind a whole tribe with his signature, or that no Indian could dispose of any land without the consent of all the two-leggeds and the four-leggeds and the ghosts and the gods to whom it rightfully belonged. But consent was no longer of interest to the party of the second part. I'm afraid that the agreements which we had made before did not make allowances for the rapid growth of the white race. You must submit to our forward progress and do the best you can. Said the party of the first part, what treaty that the white man has made has he ever kept? Not one. Indian tribes are merely domestic dependents, not sovereign nations. A parent may abrogate an agreement with his own children when it is for their own good. Because your lies have squirmed across our land like snakes, it does not make it the snake's land. This country does not belong to the Indians, but to the Almighty, and all his children have an interest in it. So meets and bounds must be set. Meets and bounds were set, and in such a way that the Almighty's white children would have all the choice land, while a few scrub acres were reserved for his red children. General Sherman defined a reservation, a worthless parcel of ground set aside for Indians and completely surrounded by white thieves. But the Indian Bureau considered them way stations between two cultures, where in isolation, Indians could somehow learn to be white men. Here, warriors were coerced into doing squaw work. Their leaders were humiliated and replaced by hand-picked chiefs. They sickened between four walls. Forced to build houses, they erected teepees behind them in which to die. Unwilling to farm and unable to hunt, the Indians were fed government rations, doled out at starvation level to keep them docile. That is, what wasn't sold to enrich the agents of the Indian Bureau. Agency beef was issued on the hoof and killed by the Indians in pathetic imitation of the buffalo hunt. That is, if it didn't die first. Much of it was so diseased it couldn't be eaten. When the Indians complained, they were punished by rations so sickening that one sympathetic agent said, the government had better issue arsenic and get the poisoning process finished with decent expedition. Then the government ordered the Sundance Lodge torn down and gradually outlawed pagan ceremonies. For the first time since the Bill of Rights, Free exercise of religion was being denied an entire people under penalty of federal law. The Black Hills. Here, the great mystery had strewn visions for the souls of Dakota warriors to prepare them for the beyond place. This was Holy Land. So sacred that a special treaty forbade the entry of white men for so long as the grass shall grow. Then, a scientific expedition invaded the hills with secret orders to discover gold, to deliberately set off such a stampede of miners that the treaty would be unenforceable. Overnight, the Indians' precious large pole timber was turned into charcoal for the gold smelters. They had called the hills their meat pack, but the two-leggeds drove away the game. Having profaned the sacred place, the whites offered to pay for it, at a discount, of course. Then they sent word to all the tribes. The government is determined that all tribal Americans shall be consolidated into two reserved areas. All who do not submit peacefully will be deemed to be hostile and will be hunted down and brought in by force. A new policy. All Indians of the plains are to be re-reservated. Regardless of tribal differences now, all are to be herded together into two big reservations, a sterile wasteland in Oklahoma and another in Dakota. There they would be domesticated, broken like broncos in a corral. 
the wild Indian was expected to purr. Instead, he started to growl. I do not want to settle down in the houses you would build for us. I love to roam over the wild prairie. There I am free and happy. When we sit down, we grow pale and die. Why do you ask us to leave the rivers and the sun and the wind and live in a house? I have only one heart. Although you say, go to another country, my heart is not that way. I am here, and here is where I am going to be. I will not part with my lands, and if you come again, I will say the same thing. I will not part with my land. My people have never drawn the first bow against the whites. The blue-dressed soldiers come from out of the night, and for campfires, they light our lodges. Instead of hunting game, they kill my braves. They make sorrow come into our camps. They are asking for war. In the camp of the blue-dressed soldiers, they were expecting war, but not asking for it. This truant chasing is at best an inglorious business, without any compensating advantage. But there would be advantage for one man, George Custer. Under a portrait of his favorite person, and also under a cloud and facing a board of inquiry for insubordination, Custer had just heard from Eastern politicians that a flashy victory in the field would not only restore his faded Civil War glory, it would guarantee him the Democratic nomination for the presidency of the United States. One man at least was anxious to hear the bugle call, Boots and Saddles. The call came, and with it, orders to round up some runaway Sioux under Sitting Bull. Refusing to be reservated, they had defiantly gone off buffalo hunting. June 1876, the 7th United States Cavalry slow trotted off to search for some half-naked savages who had also been described as the finest light cavalry in the world. They arrived about here, deep in Montana territory, when Custer's scouts reported a large Indian encampment down there in the Greasy Grass River. To engage them here would have been a violation of orders. Instead, he was to report back to his superiors, who would dispatch a larger force to bring in the fugitives. But this would mean sharing the glory, and that was no way to get to be grandfather in Washington. Besides, Custer was afraid his troops had been discovered, and the Indians might escape. Anyway, a hunting camp never held more than a handful of warriors. So Custer decided to attack. He divided his command, and he sent 136 men under Major Reno along the other bank of the river to hit the camp from the left. Then, Custer took five companies, 225 men along this side of the river, meaning to cross it and simultaneously attack the other end of the camp. One thing, between the pincer's jaws were not the few hundred Indians he supposed, but closer to 10,000. The last scene of Custer, he was riding along these bluffs, looking for a way to the White House by crossing the greasy grass, or, as it was marked on his map, the Little Bighorn. The only eyewitness account of what happened after that is contained in the drawings and actual words of the only qualified reporters, the survivors. Everything happened fast. There was hardly time to paint our faces and catch our ponies. The Wasatchew soldiers charged the upper end of our camp where the hunk papa lodges were, and we were ready for them. Our men were calling to each other, brave up brothers, it is a good day to die. The white man soldiers were surprised that we fought back so hard. They got off their horses and hid in the woods to shoot. Then they did a foolish thing. They were either drunk or crazy, but they ran out of the woods and into the river to get to the other side. We killed many in the water, but most of them got up on a hill where we kept shooting at them to let them run out of bullets and water. We had seen the other soldiers riding downstream before the fighting started. Maybe they thought to catch us running away. 
We left a few boys and warriors to keep the first soldiers on the hill. Then we all went to surprise the men who wanted to surprise us. We knew the other soldiers would try to cross the river at the best boarding place. So we got there first and crossed the river before they did. Brave up, brothers. The earth is all at last. When the soldiers got off their horses to shoot, the men who hold the horses could not hold them, and they ran all over. We got many horses that day, and the bullets that were in the bundles tied to the horses. The shooting was close together, like the tearing of a blanket. We had warriors as plenty as leaves on trees, and we got behind the white soldiers and all around them. They broke up into little groups, which made them easy to kill, like cutting off buffalo from the herd. Many white soldiers fought bravely, and our people did not go near them, but hid to shoot at them from far away. Some of the Wasichu went crazy and ran around in circles or shot their guns in the air. Finally, there were only a few left. They went up a hill a little way and stopped there, forever. The fight was over quick. It took no longer than the sun takes to travel between two lodge poles. When the fighting was over, the women came and cut up the soldier dead so that none of them could return from the beyond place and fight again. Our blood was hot and we wanted to rub out the other soldiers on the other hill. But our chief said, they are trying to live. Let them go. We have killed enough. Let the others live. It was over. We took our lodges and our women and children and went into the mountains. Then they said, we washed off our paint in the river and put the war back in the bag. But we knew it would not stay there. We would not have peace. And they were right. They hadn't sought this battle. And all that the victory brought them was 12 years of a war they could not win. On this field, the blue dressed soldiers marked where each of their dead had fallen. But without meaning to be, these were monuments to something else too. They indicate the high water mark of a culture, a way of life. And they are the last milestones on the last journey of the people who were here first. The trail is still there, the Indians say, but it's like the road of the dead, where all the footprints point the same way. And alongside it are strewn the discarded dreams of warriors and young men who had asked the everywhere spirit to let a good thing happen. And the trail is littered too with the worn out visions of the old ones, full of winters, who turned wearily off toward the camp and the stars into the land of many lodges. They say the trail is still there, dimly traced across the whole of the great plains by the poles of many pony drags. And moccasin prints branch off in roars and coolies, where children have strayed to stalk the butterfly and chase the kit fox and search for the fallen feather of a hawk. It is marked too, they say, where the grass is slashed by the unshod hooves of the buffalo ponies, and by the war ponies, with their painted flanks and the plumes of eagles woven in their manes. This is the way a people went and a way of life. An old Indian reading the trail can still see it. It's in the flash of the firefly in the night and the breath of the buffalo in the winter and in our little shadow that runs across the grass until it is lost in the sunset. <laughs>